Polly and thanks everyone for having me. I'm really excited to kind of connect with you all on this, you know, ever topical question of how can art and activism intersect to, to build kind of both powerful campaigns, but also really profound artistic experiences for people that can be kind of affecting and moving and all those kind of like juicy feeling things that <laughs> art, art has this magical power to do. So I'm really excited to connect with you all um, from all the different places that you're calling in from specifically, but then also, you know, across the world generally. Um, you know, it's such a kind of strange moment that we're in right now and it's just really nice to connect with people um, across the globe uh, in this time. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and thoughts and ideas and talking about how these things might be kind of explored in our different cultural contexts. What I'm going to do to kick off is just kind of tell you the story of what we did to use that as a, as a starting point, as a kind of jumping off point for you to then consider how would that translate to where you are and the spaces that you're working in. Um, so hoping that sounds good. Um, I'll also say that the work that's focused on oil sponsorship of the arts in the UK has come out of a number of groups doing a whole range of things and that's been activist groups as well as artist groups um, and that that work kind of began sort of quietly kicking off in the in the noughties back in the noughties so long ago now um, <laughs> and Liberate Hate emerged as slightly different to these groups because we identified ourselves as both artists and activists kind of equally and we didn't kind of preference one or the other so our work we were making art we were artists making art and also we were activists and we were campaigning and those were things that always came up for us like artists would see us as two activists and activists would see us as two artists <laughs> and we were quite happy in that tension um, so I'm gonna start a screen share um, but I'm gonna keep um, your videos in the side of my um, this so I can still see you <laughs> just so you know <laughs> um, <laughs> And I hope that's good to have some, some visuals to look at as we go through this. But, and I don't know if you also want to be able to see each other and if you know, but you can put, still put yourself on gallery view at the side there and still see everyone. Um, so yeah, uh, Liberate Tate um, is, a, is this group which got together in 2010. And we got together in response to Tate holding a party um, in celebration of 20 years of BP sponsorship. Now, at this point, we were already well aware <laughs> of kind of the number of kind of heinous crimes and the legacy that BP had, both in terms of colonialism, as well as in terms of climate change and wrecking environmental havoc around the world. And that's, you know, a legacy that will never go away. At the time, BP was also, you know, one of the world's biggest carbon emitters. Um, and we were deeply unhappy that Tate was celebrating 25 years of BP sponsorship. Um, I will say we can totally go on to talk about Greenpeace UK's position on BP right now because it there has been significant breakthroughs in that that Greenpeace's campaign on BP very recently. But you know we're talking about a time that's now actually 10 years ago when um, we really wanted to to really challenge BP's place in society. And we saw the art gallery as an important place to do that because here we had Tate galleries celebrating BP with BP logos all over their buildings. 
and they were basically saying to UK society, this oil company is not only okay, they're great. We love this oil company. <laughs> and we didn't want our art space, our art galleries, our museums to be offering that kind of social legitimacy to this oil company. So you can see in the image here one performance that we did and we made this performance on the anniversary of the horrific BP oil disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. We made it in response to a live exhibition that was happening in the gallery. So we were always paying attention to what was happening in their spaces. I don't know if you can see my little arrow. So this, this um, exhibition was called Still Life and it was all statues. And so we made our own still life and we called it Human Cost. Um, and we wanted to reflect on that anniversary, on the lives that were lost to the BP disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. We also, um, often when people see this image, they say that they see a female form. However, this is a male body. <laughs> um, it was a male performer who, who was um, uh, prostrate and, and, and laying down in the fetal position in this piece, which was a specific, a specific choice because most of the figures in the gallery exhibition are, um, are female bodies, as is often the case as the Gorilla Girls, a really great group that you may know of, have be naked to get into a gallery, um, is their famous slogan. So we made this work in reference to them, in response to what's happening in the gallery, and to remember the lives lost in the Gulf of Mexico. And we performed it a year on from the start of the spill and the duration of the performance was 87 minutes, one for every day that the spill continued to pour into the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico damaging lives and livelihoods through the, the toxic, toxicity of the oil in the water. Um, so just a little bit about um, Tate and BP at the time. So when we started our campaign, John Brown, who is the image in the second note, <laughs> the second bank note, who had been CEO of BP for just under 10 years and who still held a powerful influence over the company, was also the chair of the Tate board. So we saw this as a clear conflict of interest to have the ex-CEO of the oil company also chairing the board of the art gallery and we really wanted to focus our concerns. We made a performance where we produced these banknotes and we threw them very slowly in a kind of snow globe cascade of notes falling down in a kind of uh, large rotunda area of the gallery which just to add in another reference was also to reference uh, activity by Occupy Museums in New York where during the Occupy protests they had scattered likewise banknotes that they had made. So again that's just another reference that if you're interested in this stuff you might want to look up too. Um, I then want to talk about timepiece because I'm aware that you know climate justice is yeah, possibly a, a, a concern for some of you in this grouping. Um, so this is a piece that we made it six months before the climate talks which took place in Paris in 2015. Um, so that was you know a, a time of a lot of mobilizing in Europe around the climate talks and we wanted to particularly focus on BP as the world's third largest um, investor-owned emitter of carbon emissions and so the piece that we made was um, another durational piece so durational I mean it happens over time and it grows and it changes and it's it's a it's an art term it's a live art term that overlaps quite nicely with the activist idea of occupation <laughs> because we do duration as activists and as artists we also <laughs> take our time. So we were trying to bring these two methods together. So this was a piece that we performed from high tide on a Saturday, um, 
we did it at the weekend so it was very accessible to other people to come and join in until high tide on the sunday um the tate galleries are right on the river thames so you see the the tide rise up <laughs> over the course of the day and and down again very visibly on the river thames and it's right there beside the gallery and we used that to evoke this sense of the rising waters of climate change Tate Modern has this long slope as you go into it. Um, it's, uh, the building is an old power station, an old coal and gas and oil fueled power station, sorry. And um, it has this huge massive space which um, artists sometimes struggle with and, and some people count our interventions in this space as some of the, the most kind of like closely interactive with the space. and. This, this was a huge piece. This, um, this got global media attention. People were engaging with it online as the time zones changed because we were doing it overnight. So we were in the gallery performing for 25 hours. We performed through the point at which, um, I'm sorry, I should just say, so what, what we were actually doing was writing a kind of rising tide of words through the gallery and those words were taken from you can see the bibliography here a set of um, books on art activism the oil industry also sci-fi so we kind of put together this list of works that we wanted to imprint on tate and we wrote them in charcoal again and again in this rising tide of words over 25 hours there were a hundred performers involved but then thousands of people actually came down to the gallery to see it and then tens of thousands of people engaged online by sharing the images of different quotes from different books and kind of interacting with it um, in that way and we managed to stay overnight because we'd become very well prepared and this was using our kind of activist skill set so we had water food on the left there you can see a compost toilet <laughs> that we slyly set up in the gallery at about 11 o'clock at night when they'd cut off our access to the gallery toilets thinking that would make us leave. <laughs> the police had been present all day but they obviously they didn't want to drag a bunch of artists out of the gallery because that's really a, quite a bad look for them. Um, so we, through, through stealth and kind of activist equipment, we, we managed to stay overnight and keep performing into the morning. Um, if we've time, we can see a little video of that. You can see someone performing, um, continuing the work at night uh, here. But I just want to mention a couple more works and, and make sure that we have time for discussion. So we'll, we'll add the videos in if we have time or I, I can send some links to Holly to share with you afterward. So this is another performance work um, on the theme of climate change. We placed this in the B, what was then called the BP walk through British art. So you can hear already a very kind of establishment um, space to go into. And they had, um, they'd done a rehang and they'd positioned all the works chronologically. So from you know, like the 12th century or something to the present day. And we saw this chronological path, so through different rooms, as an opportunity to trace the rise in carbon emissions. So we create, you can see us here in what was the 1840s gallery, which is of course when carbon, uh, the burning of fossil fuels, the industrial revolution started in the UK and started to increase the level of carbon emissions in the world. So we started to count them um, out loud in unison as a group of about 50 performers. And we, in different configurations, moved through the gallery. Um, we gave performers this uh, little choreography booklet <laughs> to <laughs> um, guide people as they went through. And we counted in unison and we didn't say anything else <laughs> the entire performance. Um, but it kind of created this quite spooky, um, you know, the gallery goers who were there for the opening event instead just followed us around. Um, and by the way, we, we wore these veils partly as a kind of reference to mourning, um, well before Extinction Rebellion, I might say. <laughs> and um, 
uh, also as a way of anonymizing performers so that people felt that they could participate without it being about them individually but also to kind of emphasize us as a collective not as a as a bunch of individuals so then finally as an example of a performance work i just wanted to choose a few to give you as an example as examples i wanted to talk about um what became the last performance we made before we won and let me tell you we had more planned <laughs> but um in towards the end of 2015, so right as the climate talks were starting in Paris, we wanted to keep building that pressure on Tate to say, look, the world is trying to address climate change. You cannot keep this association with this oil company at this time. And, um, you know, sometimes you feel like you really want to spook your parents. We really wanted to like push Tate over the edge. We tried staying overnight. We wanted to push them further and we thought, you know what, we're going to set up a tattoo parlor in the gallery. They won't like that. <laughs> you know, obviously tattoo has this huge art history um, and I can send you a link for, we kind of made this exhibition guide that traced all the references to kind of art and tattoos. You know, it's um, obviously got a huge range of cultural histories in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in um, you know the uh, different uh, small island states um, in Asia Pacific, in the UK, it actually has a history from the same time that the Industrial Revolution started. Some of the first um, uh, different mechanisms of doing uh, uh, tattoos using electricity, so rather than more kind of hand poke uh, using um, the different uh, rotation um, by passing through an electrical pulse. They, they came out of the second stage of the Industrial Revolution. So we kind of wanted to make this link as well, that this, um, the, the link between tattoos and the rise in carbon emissions is sort of embedded in the technologies as well. So four of us, um, spent some time tattooing each other <laughs> to kind of build our skills in that area. We wouldn't call ourselves tattoo artists because that's a, there's no uh, training in the UK on that, but there is a kind of, there's a, there's a family and there's an apprenticeship kind of approach and there's a network and we were connected to that network, but we weren't, um, we, we weren't presenting ourselves as tattoo professionals in any way at all we were seeing this as a as a ritual act that um performers participants would want to come together to mark their commitment to climate justice by marking the parts per million um, of carbon dioxide in the earth's atmosphere in the year of their birth followed by a more than sign which then um, signified the growth in emissions since their birth with a question mark of how high are these emissions gonna go. So it created this sense of kind of narrative and solidarity and the possibility of something changing and stopping because many of the um, participants at that time, the level of carbon emissions that they were born into was at a safe level below 350 parts per million um, and it's over their lifetimes that that had increased um, so you can see people um, have the tattoos in a range of places we on their bodies um, we avoided forearms and and chests because of the particular european history related to positioning of tattoos with numbers on people's bodies and we try to think very carefully around that um, you can see one in close detail here um, so this work yeah it um it th this has been one of our longest living projects in a way because this seemed to really capture people's imagination around the world we've lost track of how many people have had this um tattoo done but it's kind of gone into its own space and become it 
become its own thing. People don't call it birthmark anymore, um, but people, um, yeah, we found there's a, there's a group of climate activists in the US who are taking the government to court. I don't know if you've heard about that case, but one of those was, one of those activists a few months, months ago was featured in Vogue about um, his, you know, climate tattoo, which was this, this tattoo in this model, but it's kind of gone on beyond <laughs> the, the place where it started. And so a few months after this was, oh, I really wanted to talk about this, but I think, we're, I think we should go into questions so we have enough time for that. Um, uh, this was when we uh, assembled a wind turbine blade in the Tate Modern. I just wanted to flash that image at you for another reference point. We also did a set of work outside the gallery. So an artist who has a number of exhibits in the gallery made this piece for us, which we sold to fundraise. And we were all uh, volunteer run and we made money by selling these paintings and doing talks and um, writing papers and so on. And we used that money to buy the materials for the performances. And it was quite a nice, succinct <laughs> economy. I wrote this book, which was published in 2015 as well. It was like another way to kind of make the case that we were arguing um, to kind of explore it in depth and kind of offer something to the arts community to kind of question um, the ethics in that space. And it worked well to have something that's kind of like, there's something about having a book which sort of says, well, this thing is real because somebody's really thought about it. <laughs> so it's a funny, funny uh, kind of world in that way. So um, I'm going to stop the, the, the presentation -y bit there because I, I do want to leave enough time for, um, for us to, to, um, to talk and ask questions. As I say, there are some videos I could show you, but I'll do that if we have time. Does that sound like the right approach? Thanks, Mel. That's, that's awesome. Oh, Sense was um, suggesting potentially that we could give you a bit longer, but I'm not sure what people's time frames and all that kind of stuff are. Can I show you one video? Look, uh, I guess, uh, I mean, yeah, we have another 30 minutes anyway, so we can do the Q&A for the last 15 minutes. So you can, you have another 15 minutes, you can go Okay, I, um, yeah, I must be, um, you know, uh, overly conscious of <laughs> not, not speaking for too long. Um, so why don't I show you a video of that one that I just gave you a tiny um, glimpse of. Um, this is slightly, sorry, um, I'm just going to take it into a particular starting point so you can see what happens when we get to the gallery. So this is the, um, this is the, uh, the wind turbine blade. So I said, you just saw the picture, um, there. So I'll, um, let me just start that screen share again. Um, this will just give you a flavor of it. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at a couple of these. I think they sort of, they tell their own, they tell their own story. Okay. Do you have that image full screen now? Is that okay? You give me a thumbs up. Great. And I have not done the other thing of sharing sound. So sorry, bear with me one second. Zoom moments. Uh, we all have them, I hope. <laughs> uh, okay, I've shared my computer sound now and totally lost the image. <laughs> okay, you have the image, you have sound. <laughs> Right up. 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 Right up.
and keep twisting. So we go to the far corner over there. You're clear? Okay, and now forward. Do me a favor. Can you go to the other side? There's more space. And then we have to check this. It's really new to go here. Please, no one Make sure. It's too serious an issue for it to go outside. This, uh, this conversation needs to take place in the gallery. Okay, push. Can we have more people in? More people pushing. It's an artistic performance. It's actually very carefully staying health and safety conscious. The safest thing you can do is let it happen, okay? It's an artistic performance. Okay. We are very, very careful to help you. We're all laying down on the floor. Hey, you roll over me. That's our business. That's simple. You roll over me. That's simple. That's it. Roll over me, and it's not going to happen. That's it. That's it. Roll over me, then. Roll over me, then. Roll over me. It is happening. It is happening. Right, so get on this side of it. Yeah. And lean into it. There you go. Okay. Okay, nice and steady now, people. We have anyone who's interested in helping out, just helping keep people away on this side for me, please. Your group is just some assistance in making sure that members of the public are yes, clear that's, as well. I've got, I've got some people creating a cordon around here now. Yeah, if everyone can create a cordon around for us. So it'll probably take another 30 minutes or so to lower this safely onto the ground. Right. And then what we plan to do is is actually give it to the Tate as a gift. Right. Which under the Museum and Galleries Act, we're legally allowed to give them a gift and for them to consider it to become a work of their permanent collection. So we've just come to deliver them this gift. Uh, just out of interest, is it? what is it? It's a wind turbine. It is a wind turbine. Yeah. Yeah. Just need to go really slowly and when we've got an inch gap, then stop again and we'll line the back up. I'm just going to switch over and show you guys one more. Um, and then let's get talking because people, yeah. There's yeah, the... it actually is, was a little bit pixelated, Mel. I think ah, so okay. Out. Let's not do it. Oh, maybe, yeah. yeah. I'll, send you, I'll send you links afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good so, idea. Sometimes it's really it nice was amazing. It's kind of reflect on the video together, but it's, yeah, it, yeah. The signal. But yeah, if you send me those links, I can send them out to people because it's, sure. yeah, that was very exciting. I can't believe you managed to actually get that to, get that to work. Um, yeah, please fire questions at me in any direction that you want to go with this, with this stuff. Um, we can jump around, we can talk about art, we can talk about making interventions, we can talk about oil sponsorship of the arts. Um, or anything else. <laughs> Go for it, guys. I've got a few questions up my sleeve, but um, 
if anyone else would like to go first, go for it. Um, kia ora. I'll go first if no one else does. <laughs> kia ora, Mel. Hey, thanks for that. It was really cool and inspiring. Um, just got a question from here in Taranaki. We've got lots of oil and gas companies sponsoring um, music festivals and galleries and um, swimming pools and stadium, everything, you know. <laughs> um, have you, um, I guess, have you got any ideas on what we could do maybe for, um, so WOMAD is probably one of the most targeted things, um, arts-wise, for climate activists here. Um, have you ever done music festivals? So in the U, yeah, that's really interesting and thanks for the question. Um, in the UK, the oil companies have never gone for the music festivals. They've always gone for the really like highbrow kind of like um, parts of arts and culture with the museums and the galleries. However, in Ireland, um, Shell had sponsor sponsored actually I think two or three different community arts festivals um, and music festivals, uh, folk music festivals on the west coast of Ireland. And um, the, there, was a, there was a gas, a shell gas pipeline planned to come in at County Mayo in Ireland. And there was a, a huge resistance camp that was there for about 10 years or so. There was a point where five local farmers were actually arrested for their resistance to shell building the pipeline. So there was a real, really big ongoing struggle about this gas pipeline of shells in, in that part of, of the country. And um, as part of that process, they targeted shell sponsorship of, um, of music festivals and they were successful. So I'll just dig out some links for you right now and drop them in the, um, drop them in the chat. Uh, Cause that, yeah, that was, that was very successful. And actually in Norway as well. So when Statoil, who are now called Equinor and have kind of remade themselves, um, but um, Statoil had sponsored a huge variety of, of music festivals in Norway. And there was, there was a whole um, build-up of, um, I'll send you the link for the group in Norway who had, who had kind of built up to resist that as well. So yeah, there's a lot of examples of, of, of people doing it and it working as well. Um, it's, you know, as soon as you say to people in that space, hey, why are these guys here? Loads of people are like, oh yeah, <laughs> let's kick them out. And when you have the artists and the musicians themselves saying we're not happy with this in our space it's it's just such a powerful statement um, about the the company's position in society as well um, yeah thanks for that question and I'll just dig those links out and, and pop them in the chat um, getting some coffee <laughs> it's really morning here by the way <laughs> um, how do you find it um, when like you don't, I think like one of the things I sometimes find is that like, there's this thing in New Zealand of that it feels like it's really hard to get funding for the arts and it's hard to get funding if, unless you're like, you're black. So it's like how often artists are kind of like, well, we need this funding because that's the only place we can get it from. What do you kind of say to people like that? So yeah, it was definitely a, a huge question for us as well in the context in which we were working we would always emphasize look you don't see the likes of bp and shell trying to support local community arts events anywhere in the country here they have been solely focused on the big institutions like tate like national theater um, like the Royal Shakespeare Company, all of whom, by the way, have dropped BP and Shell as sponsors, citing climate change as the reason now. So there's been a whole range of successes. The British Museum still has BP sponsorship and that campaign is ongoing. Um, there's lots of reasons why we can all imagine that the British Museum, with all of its colonial artifacts, is pretty behind the times on every single front. Um, and that's, yeah, another, another way. Um, so yeah, when we were looking at it, it was that it was always about these big institutions and there was a couple of artists who refused to work with Tate because, you know, sort of artists on a smaller level who refused to work with Tate. However, we, we kind of made a point of never calling on people to do that. I'm simply saying, look, 
you know, when you're an artist who's freelancing and just trying to make a, a go of things, if you work with Tate, like we're not going to castigate you for that because it's such a different level and it's not really the level at which BP is getting its social legitimacy. You know, at the same time, I think the way some of the music festivals in Norway, and it's good to have that reference on the table, um, so the way some of them worked is that a whole group of musicians would club together and raise the concern without, at first, without actually foregoing the work and boycotting the work. So I think there's a kind of like, there's, there's a few steps to the process, which, but I think definitely feeling like it's about empowering artists and saying, well, you know, what, what do you slash we want the ethics of our, our spaces to be like? I'm really working with artists as a constituency um, in a campaign um, rather than seeing it as like, you know, because of course, understanding that people have got to make a living somehow. Does that answer it? Yeah, I think so. I think it's just like, um, yeah, trying to, I think one thing I remember that you sort of said um, around like how, I think maybe it might be in your book or something, around like the, just how it's a change for these like companies. I think maybe like sometimes, especially in New Zealand, where, yeah, there just really isn't very good funding for the arts. It's like, often we kind of think that these companies are giving us like really helping out out of the goodness of their hearts or something so it's kind of like yeah I think a lot of artists are probably aware of it but maybe not the general public as much they're kind of like oh well, this is like what like this is the only way we're going to get funding but like remembering yeah I remember reading about it being just like the actual amount of money that they're giving is really tiny it's be a change for them but it's like giving them a huge kind of like social license which is much greater than the money that they're given kind of thing so yeah I guess finding ways to tell that story kind of thing to the public yeah that's a really good point thanks for 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 bringing that in as well because yeah I mean again like just finding out the numbers is so powerful and I, I don't know the exact numbers over there but yeah we spent we actually spent years in a legal battle with Tate to uncover how much money they were receiving from BP and have an official figure. And it was less than half a percentage of their annual income. So yeah, having that statistic was really powerful in us being able to persuade people that it wouldn't do Tate any harm to drop this sponsorship. It's merely a matter of relationships that they were holding on to it. Um, and then that brought us neatly back to the fact that the ex chair, uh, ex CEO of BP was the chair of the board. <laughs> um, yeah, that is dodgy. Yeah, getting the numbers can really help. But then also, you know, there's a whole kind of like, if we sort of think back, people might be familiar with No Logo by Naomi Klein, the sort of like one of her first books. She's obviously um, written loads about climate change since then, but when she was starting out talking about the presence of corporations in everyday life, really, is what No Logo was about. And you know, she questions in that this sense of like, if companies are everywhere in every part of, of our lives, what does that do? And what does that do to a sense of public ownership over public spaces? And I think having that conversation about democracy and ethics and um, is also really worthwhile because it's something that people often feel quite strongly about. Um, there's a question which came through on the chat. Should I just read that out? Um, from Jason. So um, some artists have tried very hard to bring their art back into the public realm, i.e. out of gallery spaces, which are perhaps seen as institutionalizing art. This is a great question. How do you think art activists can better engage the public in art in public spaces? Great question. Yeah, because I think in our, in our campaign, it was really important as you saw in that last video there that we went inside and we were always exploring this tension of being inside and outside the gallery you know we said from the beginning we don't want to hold a banner outside the gallery we also that's a metaphor we don't want to position ourselves as these 
antagonistic voices coming from outside the art world. We want to position ourselves inside the gallery and inside the art world as artists because that's how we can disrupt that space. And, you know, it was, it was great for us because we got this amazing space, which in the UK, these public galleries, which receive a really substantial amount of public funding, at least a third, if not more like 50 to 60% of Tate's funding is public money. Um, and then the, whole, the next big tranche of it is membership money. So it's still coming from the public um, and sales and so on. Um, if we can, um, sorry, I'm just having a little morning brain melt. Um, if we, because the members of the public can go into those spaces for free. So we're not going into a space that people would have to buy a ticket to get into. Um, which is some of the questions that come up for this kind of thing in the States because most of the, even the, the public galleries there, you have to buy a ticket to get into and the same in, in France as well, actually. Um, but these are all spaces where a member of the public can walk in for free and we would only, if we were going to do a intervention in a specific gallery, it would be one of the free access galleries. Um, so that was that was definitely important to us but of course yeah your your question is more about how can we engage the public in in our outside of the gallery space right um and i think it's a really important question and it's one that we've kind of like tried to ask ourselves more um beyond the take campaign of like there's so many ways in which you know doing performance intervention interventions in the street doing performance you know making interactive art installations which take place in public space in some kind wherever um in the cityscape um it's something that i've explored separately in my own work by um both uh, making a theater piece which took place in the financial district of london and kind of like weaved it snuck its way around different bank buildings um, something which me and Holly have explored together by um, producing this month-long occupation of, of Shell, oil company Shell's front door with, um, with musicians playing a, playing a piece of music outside their, um, outside their front door all day every day for a month while they were drilling in the Arctic. Um, so I think, I, I think it's a really important question and it's one that in a way there's like so many different answers to and i think if if you're interested in in that kind of thing i would really look up different live artists i would look at the the live art development agency would be the reference here in the uk who have a kind of really big online library of the different you know live artists will often work in non-gallery spaces so looking at artists who are working in non-gallery spaces will take you know take you into all kinds of different different spaces i think it's tricky because i think for us we really benefited from the focus that you get in a gallery space and for most of our performances the staff wouldn't try and stop us partly because we got the video is from an early days we got better at communicating with staff and like giving out a letter and working with the union and actually doing work in solidarity with them so they um, were much more receptive to us as we as the campaign went on um but we um yeah we we benefited from the kind of like sometimes staff would like radio through like there's a performance happening in gallery four is this scheduled you know because we were working on the fact that like if art happens in an art space you can kind of keep going <laughs> you're not having an immediate confrontation so i would say it's um it, it, it's a nice thing to explore as well <laughs> um as well as going into more general public spaces which can be just hard to get people's attention because <laughs> everyone's marching about and going through daily life but let's take another question if there's time anyone got a question i've got one <laughs> Another one. <laughs> what was my question? Um, what was my question? Oh yes. So it looks like you guys have 
seemingly often has like really um, good groups, good numbers and good um, groups of people. Like how did you kind of go about, like was your first kind of action you did pretty small and people were like so impressed that they wanted to get involved or like how did you kind of grow your momentum and yeah, how did you get people to want to be involved? It's a great question and it's a really important one. And I think in a way we kind of really focused on community building and seeing ourselves as kind of offering um, a sort of a space for activists to try art <laughs> and artists to try activism. And we really focused on kind of building our networks in both of those spaces. So like I say, we would do lots of talks and workshops and always, always be recruiting. <laughs> and so we ended up with a kind of email list of maybe about a thousand people or something who we would, you know, reach out to. Um, I will say we did, uh, we definitely did some learning from kind of Greenpeace groups, organizing approaches. And um, we also used, I don't know if you use letter, like postal mail um, in New Zealand, uh, but in the UK, that's one of the ways which the activist network for Greenpeace communicates with its activists and a liberate tape. We thought we'd borrow that strategy because not only is it quite a secure way to communicate with people about your plans, your secret plans, <laughs> it's also quite a sort of like artful and romantic way <laughs> to communicate in a technological age. So we would put loads of effort into these letters. We would print them with a risograph so that they just had one color. Um, print is kind of like, you kind of get quite sort of like fluoro print colors. It's kind of like 80s style of printing. We would print them onto tracing paper so that we were very kind of like watery and we would have burn after reading written at the uh, the top and bottom and that um kaya who's in the what the video i showed she actually almost set her kitchen on fire by following that uh <laughs> that instruction too well and we would like um close up the letters and use a wax stamp to seal them so we would send people these like you know written invitations to the performances and there'd always be a rehearsal before the performance which would either be on the day of the performance if there was time or a week before or something if there wasn't um so we would have a very kind of like um using a, a lot of different kind of like theater and drama type uh techniques to kind of work with a group to you know have a physical work warm-up a vocal warm-up have everybody very kind of like present and centered in their bodies which is really important for performing but it's also really important for kind of maintaining calm in an action type activity um it's also good of course for for kind of group building and and having a sense of connection with everyone in the group so we would use these kind of um drama techniques to build bring people in so we would send out these letters to like 500 people and then however many that would get back to us um by just like texting a code word or whatever we then have, you know, 100, 150 or whatever who wanted to participate because they are available. Um, and then we did really well with like, we had the, there's this artist group called KLF in the UK who um, famously burn like a hundred thousand pounds in the nineties. I don't know if you heard about that, but they're kind of like uh, wacky anarchist artists and they gave us a space their, their studio space really close to Tate where we would gather people to start with um, before a performance and um, so we just kind of I, th I think we offered people a nice like a good time <laughs> and that was important but also it was about that community that then built up around it and sustained it so it wouldn't always be this like we had a core of about 10 or 15 people who would keep thinking about the works and meet every week, um, sometimes twice a week to prepare and plan a performance. Um, but then we had a wider network of people who um, wanted to participate and were kind of engaged in the long run. Wow, that's amazing. I love the, I love the letter ideas. We called them love idea. letters. <laughs> we did call them love letters. <laughs> Some people still have them to say. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that might be us. But um, yeah, unless 
I can can't see any hands with any last questions. Can I can I ask a quick question? Please? Oh yes, please. Hello. Hi. Now I can listen to you all night out and fly over Wellington and throw things out of an aeroplane. And my lecturer thought it was an amazing idea, but I, I didn't didn't get to do it. I, I had too much of life got in the way. I was wondering um, what you did with the money that you made with the, the places on it, because I studied the international monetary system as my thesis for my arts degree. So I'm very, very interested in that money you create. And how did you use it? that prop? Fantastic. I'm just going to try and show you a, a very quick clip just to, um, to give you a flavor of it because um, it will tell the story better. And then I'll also send you the link of the, um, the Occupy Museums group, uh, which we were inspired by. So there's a space. They can take, which is this kind of rotunda type space. Um, you get a bit of a, a sense of <laughs> of that all coming down and I'll just grab for you this um, I think did I I gave you the link to the Norway um, the music festivals on the music festival question I just gave you that link but I'll also uh, give you the Occupy Museums um, I don't think they have a video sadly um, but they, you'll you'll also really not like their banknote, and they were they were questioning the whole um, the whole kind of um, the whole economy of the whole economy of uh, of of the arts um, when they did that, and it was part of the Occupy Wall Street um, protests. Um, so I'll just drop that in in just one second. <laughs> And time for a final question or? Yeah, totally, if anyone's got one. Doesn't look like it, that's cool. Maybe it's time to, time to wrap up and I guess it's like nearly, nearly bedtime. <laughs> so funny that you're just like having your morning coffee and we're like off to bed. Quite a, quite a funny old world. Yeah, um, but yeah, if you <laughs> just pop that in the, um, any looks, and we're going to put in a little, um, Spence is just putting in uh, email address so that you can email us if you do have any like questions or want, want me to get in touch with Mel or anything like that if you suddenly think of something pressing um, but yeah I feel like it's yeah such a good thing for us to be thinking about and the way that we do our activism and I love the whole like yeah kind of covered so many different that is an intersection between art and activism which is so powerful and I feel like it really can create such kind of poignant activism yeah getting like and also it just makes things fun when you've got like music and art and people often find it it feels like people can kind of participate more or something so yeah it feels like there's definitely um yeah this talk's been really inspiring for me and I think for, for all of us being able to think about 
yeah, how we can kind of create actions um, that use those creative elements. And as well, I think it's, yeah, also really cool to like just hear about standing up to like big companies, but the big corporates, which are trying to get the social license, which is something, yeah, I feel like we haven't done heaps here in Aotearoa yet, but is kind of like, yeah, in the works. And I think, um, yeah, there's been, been stuff at WOMAD last year anyway, or this year, no, last year, this year when it just was, yeah, we managed to get something in there, but um, it feels like, yeah, something that I would really like to work on more in the future. So thank you heaps, Mel, for joining us. Um, and thank you everyone for coming and learning and giving your evening to hearing about all this awesome stuff. Um, yeah, I think Sense put the, our email in there if you've got any more questions or suggestions or we want to get in touch about something. And also just a reminder that we're going to aim to have another one of these sessions once a month. Um, so yeah, definitely like tell your friends and get other people in your community that you reckon might be down for some activist sort of learning. We've covered lots of different topics over the last couple of months. So it was, yeah, really awesome to add this one into the mix. Um, and yeah, finally, I'd just like to close this hui by acknowledging everyone who's come here um, and just sending you out there in your evenings, wishing you well, and thank you for coming and, and supporting each other on this journey to be better activists and to create a more green and peaceful future. And I look forward to working with you all in the future. Thanks everyone and have a nice rest of your evenings. Yeah, Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening, uh, and uh, you have a good day, man. And we all go to sleep now, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> sleep well, yeah. everyone. <laughs> we're going to bed early, but uh, <laughs> well, we're in like in semi lockdown in Auckland, so it's like not heaps to do. <laughs> <It's more laughs> I think the whole country is about to, we're, we're, we're probably about to hold the whole country go back into lockdown at the rate we're going. So, yeah. Yeah, really? Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you've had a pretty, pretty crazy time over there. Yeah. We've got a long line of bad governments. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's hard. Um, oh, Keto, yeah. did you have? Something yeah. to say. I just saw you put a little question in there. So how about something doing it? Something at Te Papa. So Te Papa is um the museum, like New Zealand's national museum down in Wellington. We don't have the take wanna... gallery, but we, we do have Te Papa, and we could think of uh, some action to do there. Something in yeah, along totally. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, like, what Te Papa's sponsorship is like. No, I'm not talking really about um, countering oil, though that could be brought in as a theme, but just, uh, well, I mean, not in quite the same way. We're not attacking the sponsorship of Te Papa, but we're bringing up the oil subject there in some uh, act of uh, something some act like that, yeah. Uh, someone yeah. covered with oil, for example, underneath the, um, the the giant whale there. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, well, if you have like some suggestions or ideas, or you like, um, yeah, Greenpeace, we run like a community platform where you can um, Just an start idea. like groups like that. Yeah, cool. Thanks for the suggestion. Put that on the to-do list. Thank you. Have a good night, Kito. Cool. All right. Well, um, thanks for hey, being Jason. here. And I'll see you, Jason.
Cool. We're just trying to be nice and not removing people from the list. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks for having me, you guys. I hope that was. I hope that did. You know what you had intended <laughs> for the group. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, uh, it's, for sure, it's like a, quite a new topic uh, from what we have done so far. Uh, we did a similar session. I mean, not that similar in terms of art, but in art and activism. Uh, at, uh, one of the action, the climb action that we have done in Taiwan some years ago, you know, okay. uh, doing the, the rope axis uh, and uh, aerial dance, you know. So it's like an aerial mm. dance performance and then ended up with a banner and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, it's one part of it is more like a culture of uh, bringing in uh, to, you know, just to make sure that um, activism is not always needs to be confrontational, but it can be more creative, you know, going beyond those banners and stuff like that. So I guess uh, this is a pretty new topic for sure in terms of, you know, opening up uh, ideas for people to think for future actions. Sure. Great. Yeah. Yeah, it was really good. And I think um, it made me think a lot about like, just like kind of some non-Greenpeace stuff that I've been doing around like um, mining and the, like where I where I come from, there's this yeah, beautiful mountain and conservation land. And yeah, there's a lot of gold mining in that area. And so I've been part of a group that's been trying to stop that from happening. And yeah, we've done a few, yeah, a couple of few different actions, but also like a couple of sort of artists I know have been did like a really cool performance art piece and like a video they made um which yeah, it was really quite beautiful but it didn't kind of they didn't